Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at Y Charts. Michael, one of my other favorite charts from Y Charts, U.S. unemployment rate. Been looking at a lot this year. One thing I like about Y Charts, you can add the min, max, and average in the recession. So I like to add a lot of features to the graph that aren't in there originally. Oh, look at this. We are at the low unemployment rate since 1969. Now that was a nice. that was very nice. But that was during wartime as well to show how crazy. We're going to talk a lot about the labor market today, what that means for the economy, the Fed. This, I, I mean, the spike obviously is is crazy, but I mean, we're talking the whole of the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s. We never had unemployment this low before. I think if you want to know why the economy continues to be so resilient, it's probably probably this. If you wanted to boil it down to to one thing, the strength of the labor market. If you want to check it out, some of these charts, Y charts, go to them, tell them Animal Spirits sent you 20% off when you sign up for your first subscription. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. It is Monday afternoon. The market closed. Ben and I are in a hotel room in Miami. And I got to say, Ben, from this angle, you kind of look like Tony Romo. Okay, is that good or bad? I, mean, I don't know. The way that your the the lights hitting your hair, you, your hair looks darker than normal. I don't know, Michael. I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> All right, yeah, we're we've done this on location a few times, but we're gonna be doing a live animal spirits here at the Exchange Conference in Miami. I've never been to Miami before. This is a nice place. You know what they make it good here? Miami Vice, right? Mm-hmm. I haven't had one yet, for the record, but Ben did. Ben had one earlier. So if he says anything foolish, blame the Miami Vice. Okay, too much rum. Uh, any quick travel tidbits before we get into it to today's okay. show? Okay. Got anything? Do I have? Well, yeah, I, actually, I do. Funny, I wasn't going to say this, but since he asked, I signed up for Clear. I had deactivated my account probably, I guess, during the pandemic, and I reactivated my account. And I just got to say, what a delight! What an absolute delight! But you only get that if you're in New York or Los Angeles or something, right? Well, they expanded. There are a lot of locations now. When they like two years ago or three years ago, they weren't in many places, but now it's just it's just terrific. Hundred ninety bucks. For 12 months, so if you travel, it's worth it, and you walk right through. It's just uh, phenomenal. You got anything? I only The only thing that surprised me was I was I fly Delta a lot, and there was free Wi-Fi. Brought to you by T-Mobile or something. You had to sign up for a SkyMiles thing, but I already have that account because I fly Delta all the time. So I'm I was, Team Delta now. I, I, I was Team JetBlue, but now I'm Team Delta. Okay, so you got to get the Delta credit card so you can have your, your first two bags checked for free. Actually, I did. Fun, I, I just got the Amex Delta. Yeah, that's what I have. To Although do. I got I got booted. It was sort of embarrassing. I tried to get into the Delta Sky Miles Club, and uh, apparently you need the Platinum card for that. Yeah, you're not there yet. Sorry, bud. Oh, while we're talking about credit cards, do you know how much a Sapphire Reserve uh, card is up to now? Fee? Yeah. What is it, like six ninety five or something? Not quite that steep, but five fifty. Which I was going through my statement. That's a lot. That However, a lot. you get three hundred dollars in travel credit, but still five fifty. That's not that's not inexpensive. Well, they might not pay for your clear, but they pay for the global entry system, whatever, for the TSA pre-check. What do you mean? Too. If you do TSA pre-check, they pay for it. That's hmm. part of your – take it out of that too. All right. Wall Street Journal had a pretty good article this week, The Retreat of the Amateur Investor. And they start out here's, – here's the, the lead, as they say. Why, why do they call it lead L-E-D-E? I don't know. There's got to be a reason for that, right? Someone let us know. Amateur trader – Omar Gias says he amassed roughly $1.5 million of stock surge during the early part of the pandemic, gripped by a speculative fever that, cu- that cascaded across all markets. As his gains swelled, so did his spending on everything from sports betting to bars and luxury cars. He says he also borrowed heavily to amplify his positions. When the party ended, his fortune evaporated thanks, thanks to some wrong way bets and his excessive spending to support himself. He says he now works at a deli in Las Vegas that pays him roughly $14 an hour plus tips and sells area timeshares. He says he no longer has any money invested in the stock market, I'm starting from zero. He was 20, he's 25 years old. It says he racked up 300 grand in American Express Platinum Gee. Card. Oh. Hopefully he got some <laughs> points for that. Uh, according to snapshots of his account viewed by the journal, it says his nest egg had climbed to $1.5 million, was gone. I lost it all. Do you think anyone in their 20s, maybe even 30s, has the ability to cash out when you have gains of that size? Because I don't know that the human mind has the ability to say, you know what? I'm taking it off the table. I got a little lucky. This thing was crazy. Because most people probably think if I made $1.5 million in a year, if I just do that every year, I'm going to be, I'm set, right? Like you probably start saying to yourself, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to get out at 3 million or I'm going to get out, right? You have like a number where you say, if I just get to there, but that's a good point. It's, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a, I'm a gambler. So we've, I've been there and it's very difficult 
very difficult when you're on a hot streak to say, you know what? My work here is done. Your work here is never done until you, until but you leave. But it's until one of those things nothing. where you, you, you move the goalpost too, where your, your number probably keeps going higher and higher and higher. It's kind of like if I could just make X amount of money, I'm going to be set for life. I, I'll be fine. I'm not going to ever want again. And then you get there and you want to, you want to make more. Duncan says, lead originated in the newsroom sometimes be- between the 1950s and 70s, created to avoid confusion between the lead paragraph in an article and the metal lead, pronounced lead. That oh, makes sense. Which was used in the printing presses. Okay. How sure. many people do we think are fit this mold where you go from zero to over a million bucks and then you lose it all? Well, we were talking about this at, at lunch today because we are talking about crypto. I just don't know how you recover psych- psychologically from having a high watermark like that, that quickly. And then now it could take him years, decades maybe to hit that mark again. I don't know how you recover from that psychologically, knowing that you had this and now you have to work even harder to get there when you kind of did it the easy way and lucked out. I don't know how you you are able to move past that. So one of, one of the things that I was saying in 2021, there are many facets and both sides and on the one hand and the other in terms of was the meme retail mania good for investors? On the one hand, you could make the argument that it's terrible because it's teaching them all the wrong lessons and the wrong lessons are being, re- are being reinforced by the market continuing to rise. Obviously, we're on, this side, we're on the other side of it now. I also see the argument of, well, listen, the more people you have in the market, the better because these people will learn the right lessons eventually. They will learn about savings and responsible investing. Um, but I was saying that it's very hard to teach people how to not gamble, right? Like people don't, I don't know, this is a broad brush. Once you start gambling, it's very hard to, to like lose that, I Well, guess. This, this guy in the article said, I, I know what I was doing. I, I was gambling. It was gambling. It was Because he went from trading stocks to gambling on sports, and it's essentially the same thing. Now, try to get that guy to go from what he was doing to putting away 15% of his paycheck into a 401k in a target date fund, you're never going to make that that leap, right? It's difficult. That's a that's a tough transition. So anyhow, the reason why I mentioned that, like it's hard to like deprogram people from the mindset, is we just saw, uh, Carl Quintanilla tweeted, this is from Bloomberg, an, a chart from JP Morgan. Wow, that was three attributions in one citation. <laughs> the retail- Via, mar- via, via. <laughs> retail market, or- listen, I'm a big attribution guy. I, I don't, Take charts as they're my own. I, I'm a full attribution guy. So retail trading orders as a percentage of volume past the 2021 meme mania peak. So we saw Bed Bath & Beyond for reasons that are unknown to me. I don't, we, you know, not staring at the screen today. Was up 100% today based on, you know, whatever the reasons are. Uh, but how is this possible? So you saw a call option volume, I think, in a new all-time high last week. Again, retail market order as a percentage of market volume. Now it crashed, of course. But it just hit an all-time high. How? I have no explanation for this, honestly. Is it just moth to a flame, and when things start going up again, people jump back in? And so the people that created a Robinhood account, they they went dormant. Their activity was hibernating as the market crashed, and boom! As soon as you see some sort of uh, uh, some sort of like uh, upward movement in stocks, so they just right back. <sighs> this kind of go. This kind of goes against my theory that people are becoming better behaved. As investors, I suppose, but uh, I don't know. I, again, it gets back to how much of this is actually people doing all their money with, or I don't know. But I'm I'm surprised with that. And I wish I had a good explanation for it. I, I really don't. Short squeeze. It's a short squeeze in a junk stock rally. I'm sticking with that <laughs> for a while here. All right. William Cohen had a piece. On- actually, Ben, to that point, we took a poll last week because oh, we yeah. we keep saying like, is the market wrong? Is the market getting ahead of itself? Um, I forgot to make this trial. I'll do it for next week. What's going on in the market? We did a poll. Is it a bear market rally or a new bull market? 60-40 in favor of bear market rally. Is that kind of a fool me once, I'm not going to fool me again kind of thing? Ben, after the show last week, we sort of were talking about, I think that I was like hedging too much about it as a market getting ahead of itself. And I don't really, really want to make like a hard declaration because I don't, not this that confident in this assertion. Um, but man, the market just looks good. Even despite this, you know, short-term pullback that we've gotten, it just looks uh, like it doesn't want to go down. Because things in the economy are brightening up a little. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. William Cohen wrote a piece in The Spectator about Jim Cramer, and they talked about this Cramer tracker guy who apparently is some some random guy in Michigan, decided to start 
tracking Jim Cramer's stock picks and cr created like this inverse thing. And there's a few things in here. And, and they said, this guy decided to analyze the performance of stocks Cramer recommended between 2017 and 2021, over 12,000 individual calls and compare them to the performance of the S&P. It says they underperformed by 6%. Now, I have questions here about this analysis. It's, is he assuming that Kramer is advise, uh, recommending a stock and then holding it forever? That's a that's a good because question. How off, do you know when there, he could sell? Yeah, because there's there's plenty of times where Kramer will like a stock and then change his mind. The, the, this is the surprise. So I feel part like this analysis might not. It, it's it's hard, it's going to be hard to stand up to reality because you're right. When's the what's the exit? Uh, the analysis also showed that the volume in the stocks Kramer recommended increased some 25 percent the day after. People were following his advice and promptly losing money. He has so, so what what is clear again? I don't know how this analysis was conducted is that Kramer still has massive, massive influence. By yes. the way, Confessions of a Street Addict, not a good book, a great book. It was, it's actually very good. Well, he lived in his car while he was studying to be a trader. But my take on this is I think it's easy to make him a punching bag and say, see, look, look. But if you're talking about 12,000 different companies, I mean, I think there's a big difference between entertainment and advice. And maybe mm. his biggest thing is that he's not going out and saying, listen, this is entertainment. The fact that I know as much as I do about this many stocks, how many stocks could you name? <laughs> could just, I name? Just their name. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, there's 12,000 here. Yeah, I do think that, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know, it's not obvious. I think that Kramer's trying his best, right? I do believe that he's up at four in the morning, like reading the reports and, and earn, putting an earnest effort into being the best that he could possibly be. But I think the, the overall point is 12,564 stocks. That's a lot of stocks. How can somebody possibly know that much about all those stocks. But here's my biggest take on this of all, is that the difference between entertainment and advice is you should not be taking advice on on your own portfolio from anyone that you see in TV or in print because they don't know you. They don't know your circumstances. True. And it's kind of like if you wanted to take some of their analysis and then create your own opinion and do your own homework, that's fine. But just because someone says buy because I bought or sell because I sold, doesn't like the Michael Burry thing where he just tweeted sell. Right, right. Don't listen to any. Don't listen to the buy people or the sell people. Do your own homework. I feel like, the, but yeah, but you're not wrong. So I don't want to say yeah, but I would just say that it's so hard because if Kramer is bullish on a stock that I like, it makes me feel better. I know it's ridiculous, and we know better. But when you see somebody who agrees with your point of view, you get a little warm and fuzzy inside. It's just, it's just how we're wired. Confirmation bias is a hell of a drug, right? Yeah. All right. This is this is an interesting part of of the market this year so far. So I looked at this last week. So these numbers aren't completely up to date, but I, I looked at the boring sectors from last year, consumer staples, utilities, healthcare. They all basically were flat or up. Utilities were up. Consumer staples were down less than 1%. Healthcare was down less than, or about 2% last year. This year, this is through basically the first week of February. They're all down as the market's ripping. Last year, technology, communications, consumer discretionary, all got wrecked. Communications is was down 38% last year. Now that's, I think 40% of that is, is I think it's Facebook and Google. Facebook and Google. Yeah. And technology and consumer discretionary all ripping this year. It's funny because the, the thing people said was just because we turned the page in the calendar does not mean that the stock market's all of a sudden going to change. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened. I know some of this started before then, but it, yeah, I, I agree with you. There was, I don't care what anyone says. There was a mental reset in January. There just there, is. There was. And for whatever reason, it, it doesn't make any sense why there should be because, oh, we changed to a new year, now, a new wait, month. Wait, 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 wait. But, 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 but it, it also did coincide with improving economic data. Yes. Decreasing interest rates, which are now back on the rise again. These companies doing massive layoffs. Like the market did like all of those things for fundamental reasons. So had those things not transpired, had earnings not come in, in certain cases, a little bit less bad than expected, these stocks could have fallen more. But I think- So that, it's not just a calendar thing. I wrote, a blog, I, I wrote a blog post on this about Facebook it, specifically because it was down like 76%. Now it's up 100% and it's still down 50%. And the thing is, I just think you're wasting your energy to think about like these sectors or stocks that you wish you would have bought because more than likely you probably would have bought them too early and bought them as they still crashed as opposed to like nailing the bottom. No one is going to nail the bottom exactly in these things. I did, don't, don't, I did, don't I did, tell I, me you did. I did literally buy the bottom in Facebook. Like I think I bought it on November 4th. Is that right? Was that the bottom? Well, anyway, listen. Pretty close to So, it. I mean, sometimes you get, listen, I, I, it's the first time, my, it's first, yeah, that was, that was the first time in my entire life, quite literally, that I bought the bottom. But so I, sometimes I, you get lucky. I just think that, that that's the thing, though, is that just, you could, 
my whole point is that there's there's always going to be something crashing or something going crazy, and to think that you could nail the top or bottom and all of them is just is wasted mental. I'm energy. pretty sure I've tried to buy the bottom 99 times and it worked out once. So, all right, Jeff Weniger tweeted an interesting chart. He's showing the S and P 500 value divided by S and P 500 growth. He's also showing the 10 year Treasury yield. So he said value versus growth has stopped caring about interest rates. Last year, quote, if rates are going higher, I want to own value, not growth. Once rates start falling again, growth will start working again. But rates are now falling, and growth is still not working. It's a value cycle. I think people probably took the interest rate thing too far. I think the correlation causation thing there is these kind of shifts in interest rates can cause a huge pivot. But then I don't think it's just going to be a one-to-one correlation thing where it's automatically going to track. That was my take. So I think I think there was causation. I think interest rates rising, cash flow uh, be, becoming more valuable in the short term. I think that absolutely tilted the deck in favor of value against growth. I absolutely believe that. But now that that trend reversed and rates started to fall, I think that like the momentum impact of value, I think investors started repositioning and it was not necessarily, it started out as an interest rate story, but now there's more, more dynamics involved. Takes? Yes, but I don't know when this chart goes through, but growth is working this year. Um, All right, here's a quote from Evercore via Jonathan Farrow. The market, rightly in our view, faded the hawkish jawboning, focused on the Fed's recognition that disinflation is underway, and perceived that there is a path to a pause after one more 25 basis point hike in March. So last week, Jerome Powell got on stage. Also, good word, jawboning. I I was saying for months that the Fed's tough talk, I like jawboning better. Yeah, the market looked right past it because he wasn't like dovish by any stretch of the imagination. Right, he still said we have work to do, but clearly, clearly, uh, I don't know if what they're doing. I don't know how much of, of raising interest rates is responsible for inflation coming down. You know, we'll see. Um, but uh, so he he said in his Heather Long tweeted this. Powell said in his in his talk last week. I continue to think there is a path to getting inflation back down to two percent without a really significant economic decline or significant increase in unemployment. This is not like the other business cycles in so many ways. And I'm having a hard time figuring out whether, again, the Fed was talking so tough and now they're changing their mind because th- they were trying to get the unemployment rate to fall, to rise, and it wasn't happening. So do you think the Fed is finally relenting a little bit? Because it felt like, to me, his talk last week was a total sea change in what they've been saying. Do well, you- it's not just, it's not just, uh, listen, unemployment is coming down. To, is at an all-time low, literally at an all-time low. Well, not all time low. It it got a little lower in the fifties, but oh, that was fine, wartime. But it's 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 in the second percentile or something. And wage pressures. Remember the wage spiral? Wage increases are coming down dramatically. So I don't expect them to spike the football, right? And cause like a stock market bubble again. But this is setting up for a soft landing. Well, yeah, look know? look at the wage growth chart from the New York Times. So they're showing the consumer price index and wages both rolling over at the same time. And so one of the weird things that happened was the last few days in the markets, Friday especially, because we got a really good jobs number, the, the interest rates shot up. And I think I texted you like, was this jobs report too good where the market might take it negatively? But it's almost like it's a positive for the economy though. So the weird thing is you would have thought the Fed having to hold the rates high. If you would have said before the year started, the Fed is not going to cut. They're going to hold rates higher or increase them. You would have thought they're doing this because of inflation. And for part of the year, they were. Now I think the Fed could keep rates higher or continue to raise them because the economy is stronger and the labor market is stronger than they thought, not just inflation. So it's almost like it's moved to the economy. Like I think we're, we could get like a really strong GDP number in the first quarter of the year. So yes, so I think that's what the market is saying because on Thursday, the 10-year got as low as 3.3. Now it's up to almost 3.7. So interest rates are up a lot, maybe anticipating actually the Fed would not have reason to cut and maybe the market can can digest these rates. What a bizarre situation that we find ourselves in where people were worried about stagflation and now it's the opposite where inflation is falling and growth is rising. What, what's ch- the opposite of stagflation? The opposite of stagflation? Growth? With <laughs> yeah. Loan? I don't know, Goldilocks? Uh, how money is this shirt, by the way? Got a lot of compliments. It's pretty nice. We're got rocking a the Tropical Bros here. We, Thank we, you, Tropical Bros. We, we, got, we don't want to spoil anything, but we got some... Did you see? We got some... Uh, renderings of a potential <laughs> animal, <word>. animal spirits <laughs> shirt 
and uh, it's it's coming. We'll we'll see. So- uh, wait. All right. So one of the things that was interesting about the Fed report is they removed references to COVID nineteen pandemic and supply chain backups from the statement. So we're we're basically that all the supply chain shenanigans is behind us. And I have a story for that. So my partner Chris, who lives uh, uh, two towns over from me, he was he's in the market for a jet ski, right? So he could uh, join me and have fun on the water. His jet ski is thirty percent lower than what I paid for it. Oh, really? So Chris showed me the price, and he goes, "I go, is that for the same model that I have?" He goes, "Yeah." I said. Wait, what? Because I still owe a lot more money than, than than the new one is worth, which I knew that I was buying the top. It's fine, it's, you know. Uh, but so he you goes, bottom tick Facebook and you top tick jet skis. Fair, fair. I'll take it. He goes, why are why is it so much cheaper? I said, because there's jet skis now. Not only so when I got mine, there was one model left. They could charge one, what they wanted. There was there was not one model. There was one jet ski. Like that was it. I, there was one jet ski. Take it or leave it. Now he could design his own. What colors do you want? Like what what. Uh, Whatever. So you could design your own jet ski now, which is a, a far place from where we were in uh, whatever, whenever we were. All right. There was a chart. Who did this? This is from Semaphore. The title of the chart is called More With Less. It's showing workers needed at S&P 500 companies to generate $1 million in revenue. Ben, I did the version of this a long time ago. Remember, I, 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 this is like trying to make the case for why maybe stocks are trying are trading at a higher multiple today. Yes. Why valuations have crept up over time. And one yes. of the things that I wrote was like, think about the first billion dollar corporation was US Steel. And they needed like 500,000 workers to generate a million do- a billion dollars in revenue. I'm making the numbers, but they're directionally right. And Facebook is doing that with one 300th. This chart right here is why you remain bullish on humanity. And the people, I've gotten a few questions in the last couple of months of people in our inbox saying, why do stocks need to continue to go up in the future? Like, why couldn't there be this permanent plateau where stocks stop going up? And this chart is a really good single explanation to explain. People just keep getting, people keep innovating. They keep getting more efficient. This chart, I mean, it's, this chart doesn't go back that far either. It's only like the, the 80s, right? Yes. Long-term bullish. Uh, all right, where are we going next? Uh, so here's one person who's going against the grain on the Fed. So- Jeremy Siegel, this is before Friday's labor report. I don't know if that will change his mind at all. Heath says, I don't think rates are going to remain higher. I think they're going to go down dramatically in the second half of the year because of a weakening economy and the control over inflation. He said, I think that's what the market is looking forward to. So he says there still could be a slowdown, mild recession, and then the Fed's still going to have to cut. Could be. Yeah, for sure. Definitely could be. So, But, but it's funny that the, the reason that we wouldn't get that to happen is because the economy is strong, not because inflation is staying, is staying higher. Uh, someone actually... I wrote something about the – I tweeted the other day about the fact that this is this is the strongest labor market we're ever going to see in our lifetimes. And it, it's hard to argue that we could see anything stronger than this, right? It's it's just defied expectations and, and economic logic, and I think a lot of the textbook definitions of what's supposed to happen in the economy. Someone wrote to me, I'm a supply chain professional. I've never seen the labor market so desperate for workers. So many people in and out of – uh, of it tolls quickly as well. I don't see this ending soon either. I think this is get back to that labor hoarding thing we talked about where it's really tough to tell employers to fire a bunch of people if they just spent two years trying to get back up to fully staffed or having a hard time bringing people in. And I mean, a lot of people will say, listen, every time the unemployment rate is this low, it's only got one way to go. It's going to go back up, right? So th- this could signal the end of something. I, I, I am, uh, I do understand that line of thinking. So it's hard to know how long this can continue, but it's already gone on further than a longer than a lot of people ever thought they could. Interesting chart from Colin Roche, incredible collapse in M2 money supply growth. People were very concerned this would cause hyperinflation back in 2020. This is a staggering chart. It really is. And again, too early to spike the football, but the fact that the Fed was able to do this and again, how much credit they deserve, we could debate about that. I think that you need to give more credit to the fiscal spending than the Fed for this though. That's not what I'm talking about. The fact that, yeah, this is, you're right. This is not necessarily. But, so you're saying the fact that they've brought it way back. The thing is, this chart doesn't go back to the 70s, but. But the fact that we can remove this much money from the system and not have an absolute yes. total and collapse in everything is pretty remarkable. So this chart does not go back to the 70s, but I, I did a piece looking at like why a lot of people thought this is going to be the 70s all over again with inflation. Money supply grew in the 70s, like basically the entire decade. And the fact that we've already, we're on a negative trajectory here, which is the going back 40 years, 40 plus years, we've never had the year over year change be this low. 
uh, is pretty remarkable. We did not have that in the 70s. They, they kept the punch bowl in for way too long. Jeffrey Kleintop tweets, green shoots? Question mark? <laughs> I'm Ron Burgundy? <laughs> IMF upgrades global growth outlook for 2023. Biggest upward revision among major economies seen in Germany and China. Ben, your macro thoughts? All right, moving right along. No, I... I- <laughs> <laughs> You're the king of moving right along. Every, you don't look at the qu- the the things on YouTube every oh, week. Duncan, Duncan, so Ben and I are in the same room, and Duncan goes, "Try not to talk over each other too much." For <laughs> yeah. but the, I think if anything, people thought the U.S. is going to remain the cleanest shirt and dirty hamper. Europe is definitely going into. I'm recession. sorry, that line was retired in 2016. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't use it anymore. Nope. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that was a Bill Gross one, maybe. But people thought for sure China, if, if they're locked down, they're going to be slow. Europe for sure is going to be locked down because they're going to have to burn their houses down to stay warm in the winter. And yeah, I, I, it, another another surprising outcome, obviously. So uh, car prices are shooting up again. Carl Quintanilla, again, U.S. auto sales at 20-month high. Uh, from Morgan Stanley, U.S. January sales, what slowdown? U.S. seasonally annual adjusted rate is the highest in 20 months. EV shares over 8%. What the hell is going on? There's some weird. But that doesn't mean that prices are higher, though. That just means that more sales are happening. No, prices are rising. Car, the car dealership guy has been tweeting about it. Okay. Uh, Connor Sen, this is a good chart. We're looking at uh, car prices divided by CPI. So he says a lot of talk about how new vehicle prices have surged over the past couple of years. Here's new vehicle prices as measured by the CPI divided by average hourly earnings. Not sure we get lucky like we did from 95 to 2020 again. So actually, even though car prices are absurd, it looks like adjusted for wages and inflation, they've just gone straight down. So cars have become much more affordable. That's pretty surprising. And you also think how much more efficient they've gotten and how much more technology you get with a car. And if you adjust for the size of the car, this chart crashes super cheap. The Tahoe is actually a bargain. That's true. But if you if you adjusted this for retirement savings, you would see people aren't saving enough for retirement because they're spending more on their cars and trucks. Um, yeah. This show is brought to you by Carl Quintanilla. We have here's another chart in here. <laughs> <laughs> Again from Morgan Stanley. Demand for services, especially travel, held up well last year, but we think consumers and companies will tighten their belts as we could progress through 2023. So trip bookings are falling. This is sort of the thing that we keep talking about. It's like, how long can the consumer I, I, remain strong? It's I know you can't go with anecdotal observations to figure out the economy, but I just went to our local pizza place, Vitali's. Great pizza place in Grand Rapids. It's been around for a while. They've got a new restaurant in the last couple of years by our house. I like to go there for pizza. I went just to pick up the pizza because I said last week I'm not going to get it delivered because I don't want to do that, right? I, I'm going to DoorDash shame you because you're the problem with inflation when you keep getting your DoorDash. And I went to go pick it up, and I literally could not find a parking spot. It was so busy. There was line out the door for takeout. The restaurant was bumping. There, there was no spots left in the huge, huge parking lot that they have. People are still spending money. Airport was still pretty booked for uh, busy for me too. How about you? Uh, it wasn't that packed. All Not right. compared to last time. I've got this is from the Wall Street Journal. I've Wait, got, did I just get bearish? <laughs> <laughs> so they said state governments are entering 2023 with record high reserves, which could help the overall economy weather recession this year. The rapid recovery from the pandemic combined with an influx of federal stimulus money has filled public coffers allowing governments to squirrel away funds for emergencies. Remember when, who was the, the 2008 person? Oh, uh, Meredith, Meredith Whitney. Whitney. How, how municipal bonds are going to crash. Look at this Look at this chart of how much their rainy day funds went up. State and local governments together make up 11% of total spending in the U.S. economy. That is, I don't know what that, I would have thought that number is, but it's high. They account for about 13% of total payrolls, more than manufacturing, construction, retail, or leisure and hospitality. Wait, what does that mean? State and local governments make up 11% of total spending? There's Yes. Isn't that – that's a huge number, right? That I never They account f- for 13% of total payrolls, more than manufacturing, construction, retail, or leisure or hospitality? Huh? That's, that's massive. So I, I had this theory last summer that I've never seen so much construction going on in our area before. And I think the reason for it is because these states are so flush with money, they have to spend it. And now they're pulling forward all these, these construction – things that they should have been doing during the pandemic when no one was driving as much. But it's it's hard to believe that it took a pandemic and all these states are in a much better position. Uh, Sam Moreau, the average price of a dozen eggs is down more than 40% from its highs. Boom. Boom. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Here's the thing. I know we, we as a society love to complain. I like to complain as well. I, it, sometimes it's just cathartic to complain, but people complain about stuff going bad and prices going up. 
They never talk about when prices go down. People complain about gas prices on the way up. Not a, not a peep when it comes down. Correct. Nobody's like, did you see how much we're saving in gas? This is awesome. Yes, exactly. So I'm just saying, people people complain on the way up and not on the way down. And then they don't right, give credit on the way down. Let's skip this Whole Foods thing. Splunk cut 4% of the workforce. Impossible Foods, 20%. This is just last week. Workday, 3%. PayPal, 7%. HubSpot, 7%. NetApp, 8%. PayPal is laying off 2,000 employees. Kronos, 24 The biggest dedicated online marketplace for luxury watches. Cut about 30% of its workforce. Uh, th- 65 jobs. Did not know that there was a company called Splunk. You never heard of Splunk? Sorry. Um, so Justin Wolfers tweeted, for every headline you read about the surge in layoffs, it's worth turning to nationally representative data to get some context. Here's the latest numbers. So monthly layoffs as a share of employment. There's, no, there's nothing here. No. In fact, it's, it's, o- it's coming off an all-time low. I-, I do think it's the kind of thing, it's headline porn where if, totally. you, if you post that, you know it's going to get some action that oh another company had is laying some people off it's it's bad so uh charlie munger does not like crypto this is a very weird op-ed it was like very short and he was like very into what china's doing again it was just weird i think is he 99 years old i'm sorry but if i'm 99 years old and i'm still putting out op-eds to the wall street journal just with flaming hot takes i kind of respect it you I know i mean okay he that's said a take he said, such wretched excess has gone on because there is a gap in regulation. A cryptocurrency is not a currency, not a commodity, not a security. Instead, it's a gambling contract with nearly 100% edge for the house entered into in a country where gambling contracts are traditionally regulated only by states that compete in laxity. Obviously, the U.S. should now enact a federal law laxity? that prevents this from happening. I've never heard that. that uh... L- lanolin? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm just saying, if you're a crypto person... Should you care what Charlie Munger thinks? He's 99 years old. Does it really matter? Of course not. Probably not. But again, I respect the fact that he's 99 years old and still just whipping out hot takes. Uh, yeah. I uh, don't hate it. Uh, well, I don't love it, but all right, whatever. Um, all right. Arc is out with a 2030 Bitcoin price prediction. The base case. <laughs> Jeez. Come on. Come on. I just read it. The base case is six hundred eighty-two thousand. This is the, what would that put the market cap at? See, all the trillions. You've got to up. We talked about your ten predictions that you made. You've got to up your game a little bit because you are nowhere near predictions like Arc is. Because here's the thing: you put out a lot of these numbers, and every year they put these numbers out that EV is going to be ninety-five percent of the market in four years, and Tesla is going to be worth nine trillion dollars. If you put some of these out, and eventually one of them hits, you're a genius. And the ones that you said that didn't come. To fruition that eh, people super All right, so the base case is a 60% compounded annual growth rate from here. <laughs> that seems reasonable. Here's the bear case. See, so this is what this is what this is what gets people. The bear case, again, bear. For new listeners or non-financial people, bear means bad. The bad case, the bear case, 258000 So the bear case is a 40% compound annual growth rate. How is that a bear case? How about a bear case is like, I don't know, $5. That's my bear case, five bucks. You know, I I explained the bull and the bear to my daughter the other day. She saw the animal spirits thing on something and I explained, you you know why it's called that, right? Bull and bear. A bear hits down with its paw and a bull gores up. I don't think that's right. No? That's no. that's what I always heard. No, it was something from like old England. Yeah, that's not right. No, but that, that's a good explanation though. The bear swings down, the bull goes up with his horns. Okay. No, I, I that's simple. I like it. All right, Lance, let's move on to real estate. Lance Lambert, we're in a bifurcated housing market. San Francisco is down 10.5% from its peak. Chicago is down just 0.1%. So these are prices. Thoughts, Ben? I guess it it makes sense that it's kind of like the economy where there's certain parts of the economy that are doing better or worse than others. Tech is one of the places, and Chicago didn't go crazy like some of the places in California did in the upswing. This makes sense, right? Yes. And, and I think that's that's probably what's going to happen with the economy. But look at this. It looks like New York. Is that an all-time high? Pretty close to it. But look at, look at the spike you saw in Seattle, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. It makes sense that those ones fell the most, and they're still well above the trend from the other places. Uh, John Burns, this is interesting. New homes priced below 200K are now 0% of the market. They were 40% of the market one decade ago. 
Homes for 500K plus have grown from 17% of the market to 38% of the market. Expect both of these trends to reverse this year. I'll take the other side of this. I'm of the opinion that the $200,000 homes are probably never coming back because no one builds those anymore. If you look, go to, go to, this some, is a, this is a, by the way, credit to John Burns Real Estate Consulting. This is a great chart. That's a, that's a pretty good We're chart. We're looking at new homes sold by sales price, percentage of total sales over the rolling 12 months. This is, this is really well done. Wow, look at this 500K. That is wild. Well, think about people, you were talking about people who locked into 3% mortgages. Think about if you were a person who locked in a $200,000 house at a 3% mortgage. Are you really in how low your mortgage payment is? If, unless you need more room, are you really going to want to sell that thing? But the thing is, go through an old neighborhood and look at how small some of the houses are that they built back in the 1950s, maybe 60s. They don't build houses that small anymore. No right. new construction. You, you never see new construction of tinier houses anymore. It, unfortunately, I think the home builders just aren't incentivized to do that. All right, here's an interesting one to me. This is from New York Times. Single women own and occupy more homes than single men in the United States, despite earning only 83 cents on every dollar that men earn, according to a new study. Report put out by Lending Tree analyzed data from U.S. Census Bureau, and it found that 10.76 million U.S. homes were owned and occupied by single women, while 8.12 million were owned and occupied by single men. I have an idea for a new dating app. Single <laughs> women who own a home. If you were, if you were a gentleman in the market for a, a new lady friend or a woman in the market for a new lady friend, would you not want to date someone who owns their own home? How, how much of a head start do you have on life for someone who already owns their own home? Now, obviously, a lot of this could be widows. They mentioned that, and they said even though women on average earn less than men a lot of, in, other, in some other areas, the earnings are similar, and especially in like the bigger markets, I guess, women uh, do better. But wouldn't, wouldn't you pay to sign up for that app? It's not a bad idea. People who own homes, I, I'm, I'm willing to find a mate who has their own home. Um, let's move on to some private market stuff. There's a chart from PitchBook showing the private market SaaS ARR, which is annually recurring revenue multiples. This went from under 20 and 17 to 20 and 18 to 25 and 19 to 40 in 2020 to 110 in 2021. It's a little high. Uh, Gavin Baker tweeted, Stripe doing a clean down round is healthy for the ecosystem. I actually didn't see this. Oh, Stripe did a down round? I didn't see this. Many companies that raised at absurd multiples will need to raise again soon. Majority will be down rounds. Or, but anyway. How, how about this as a thesis? It's going to be hard for new entrepreneurs to raise money because so many VC and private funds are going to have to put money in to shore up their old holdings that they already have. Yeah. I, I said it's less of a thesis and more just like a, a, a you know, an obvious statement of fact. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just not, it's just what's that was happening. Captain so, obvious. All right. Well, yeah. uh, all, right. all right. Let's move on to, Oh, I changed it. Maybe, maybe this was a top. I, so we had the, the segment for great quarter guys. So it had been decent quarter for about a year. I just changed it back. Great quarter. Back to great quarter guys. All right. So Facebook reported, uh, and the entire call, the entire call, and this is why Wall Street runs everything. Was it just an apology to her? It was just all about efficiency. That was absolutely the theme of the call. Talking about expenses, where they're putting money. Reality Labs is still losing gobs of money. Just gobs. I think it was $13 billion in the last quarter as they, uh, whatever, as they try to clean that up. They talked about- But he, uh, he basically said, we're not going to go as crazy as we were going. They talked a lot about avatars. I noticed this. I actually put this in the doc before they reported- you can now create your own AI avatar on Instagram. Did you know that? What does that mean? It, it'll create a, you put a, upload a picture of yourself and it gives a rendering? A rendering. There we go. That's exactly right. That's, is that twice I've used that word in this? Must be on um, top of mind. So family of apps ad revenue was $31 billion, down 4%, up 2% on a constant currency basis. For a company that was like supposedly in like massive trouble uh, and at the heart of an advertising slowdown, up 2% year over year? Oh, after a record year, it's not so bad. The the bad news had to be baked in. The comp it was one of the biggest companies in the world, and it was down seventy six percent. They reached two billion Facebook daily active users for the first time, which is pretty pretty nuts. Okay, you own expense, this. You own this stock. Outlook came down. Yeah, I own it. How long would you plan on owning it for? It's been a huge pop. It's doubled. Yeah, from the bottom. Um, Are you still confident in this company long term? Long term, this is not a buy and hold forever type of stock. Um, 
I still think that I don't want to sell too early. Um, I'm not, you know, I think it's got momentum behind. No it. one ever went broke taking a profit. I heard that once. That's true. Um, that is true. Uh, but I, I still think that like, it's just under owned. Uh, I know that sounds ridiculous. I say it. I'm embarrassed having those words kind of out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> But they're turning it around. They so they cut guidance in a good way on their expenses. Uh, so anyway, uh, things were not as bad as feared. I was on the Compound and Friends with Jason Chu and Josh when Apple reported, and I was I was surprised. I think the stock initially popped. I was like, hey, I feel like it should be down, and then because they missed right, like it just it wasn't a great report. And then on Friday, the stock was up huge. Not a short term, but. Your reaction to stock earnings on the Compound and Friends is a perfect example of recency bias mm-hmm. because it's, it's funny to listen to it like the day after or the day after, you know, a couple days later. Yes. Because you think like the, the initial pop or crash is like, oh, here we go. And then it's funny how often that just reverses and it means nothing because of this after hour stuff. Totally. Um, we, so actually, we were light on the dock this week for great quarter, guys, because I know whatever. Uh, anyway, um, AWS is slowing. What's the stock doing? Uh, stock, I would, let's see. Sorry, I'm lagging. My internet is slow. Is there any hotel that has fast internet? Is that, a, is it possible? I mean, I, I understand because you have so many people using it probably, but I don't know if I've ever gone to a hotel or I've thought like, wow, this internet is actually pretty good. No, so it looks like the stock's down like 10% in the last two days since it reported. Google also, similar story. Um, was it YouTube growth that missed? Anyway, Google and Amazon did not report. Neither did Apple, actually, for that matter. All right, that was weak. That was weak. We'll do better next time. My bad. That was that was that was on me. That was on me. I forgot to fill the dock. I'll take the L on that one. It's okay. Um, this is interesting. Somebody tweeted, we're moving on to personal finance. Somebody tweeted 32% of workers make under $15 per hour. That means 32% of workers make less than $2,400 per month. The median price of rent is $1,978 per month. This is unsustainable. Again. 32% of workers make less than $2,400 per month. The median price of rent is nineteen seventy eight. dollars So basically, it looks like 85% of, uh, of income is going to rent. Now, somebody quote tweeted, and I'm not usually a fan of the quote tweet with a dunk, but this is just important. It's important to correct the narrative because this narrative that everybody is falling behind, that uh, people are living just uh, hand to mouth, while there is definitely some truth in that, it's not all truth. So this person retweeted and said, Actually, I'm saying the actually, but they said median weekly earnings for Americans working full time is $1,084 or $4,300 every four weeks. A median earning couple would thus have around $9,000 of income every month, making median rent just 22% of their income. So the point is you can play with the averages and some of those workers making under 15, they're working part time. They're not working full time and it's not as clear cut as you think. And- the median price of rent, people who are making less money probably live in places where it's not as expensive to live. I, the 32 number, 32% number does surprise me because you would think a lot of those people would be trading up at the moment since there are $15 per hour jobs listed everywhere you go these days. But you know, there's been a lot of talk about people just gorging on credit card debt. Yes. Well, there's a great chart that busts that myth. Credit card debt back on trend. This is from Arpit Gupta. That is a great chart. So- There's credit card spending, which crashed, absolutely crashed during COVID, and it's now all the way back on trend. I'm having difficulty squaring in my mind what exactly happened in the pandemic because the whole idea was, well, we sent out these stimulus checks and people just literally spent every dollar they got. But that's obviously not true because the credit card debt plummeted. People paid off their, and we had the excess savings, so people paid off their credit card they saved more money, but they also spent more. So, how- people, no, no, no. People were not spending during the pandemic. They were gambling. True. I, I guess the spending happened a little later, but it's it's surprising to me that people thought like all people did with that stimulus money was spend it. Not sure. They paid down debt. I, exactly. That's the point. Like, it, people act, like if people have higher income, they're going to make fiscally responsible choices. And that's what happened here. And then the money you know, stopped and they, they had to go with the debt again, but it, it, it's not as simple as people, the government sent money and all of a sudden everyone just spent every dollar. That's not what happened. Here's one from the wall street journal on 401ks. 
I'm I'm having trouble with this one a little. Squeezed by higher prices and short on cash, more Americans are tapping their 401ks for financial emergencies. A record 2.8% of the 5 million people in Vanguard's 401k tapped their retirement savings in 2022 to cope with hardships as such as medical bills, evictions, or foreclosure. The company said that's up from 2.1% in 2021. Pre-pandemic average about 2%. They also said in this article, the increase in the number of people taking hardship withdrawals is partly driven by several government moves in, since 2018 that have loosened the rules for taking such distributions. And one of the rules they said, like, you don't have, in the past, I think you had to prove you have hardship, like prove to take it out. I, they did away with that. Like, you have to provide proof. Do you think it's just, if they made it easier for people taking out money, it, it's not like inflation or the economy or layoffs, people just decided, like, eh, I don't really need this money in there anymore. Stocks are up. I'm just going to spend it. Yeah. Like, is this really, I don't know that this is necessarily an indicator of stress among people. And some people. You, we were talking about earlier about, do people, do people ever cash out? Boom. Vanguard investors, True. stocks got a little expensive. And they're just, uh, you know, taking a little chips off the table. I think if you make it easier for people to, that's one of the great things about tax deferred retirement plans. It's not easy to take the money out and probably shouldn't be. Ben, did I just say that I'm not selling Facebook because it's under owned? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest companies in the world. So it's that, yeah. Somebody tweeted to us, just a PSA. A few months back, you guys were trying to decipher the definition of gaslighting. The old woman who hit Michael in the parking lot is a textbook example of gaslighting. <laughs> True. <laughs> a lot of, there was a lot of people who, who who did say Michael had kind of a weird weird week last week. He got I, hit by the car. He got yelled at. I had a realization the other day. I left my house during the daytime, which I never do. If I'm working from home, I don't leave. I just stay put. But I know it's different for you because you, you don't work from home. But I had a realization – I, I don't know why. I never, ever, ever, ever go out for lunch when I'm working from home. I never order in. I just eat whatever's in my fridge. Is that, do you think that's normal or a little unusual or? No, it's probably just easier. Like I, I do take out all the time because I work in an office, but I guess if you're home and it's just, it's plus that way you can just keep going through your day, right? You don't have to break it up. Now that makes sense. If you have decent leftovers and, and not bad food in there, it makes sense. A lot of people did. You said the lady was 20 clicks away, not knowing how far a click is. <laughs> yeah. And a click is, what, one kilometer? <laughs> I didn't know that either. A click, yeah, a click is uh, almost a mile. It's, some, so. it's something you hear in, like, Western movies. Like, ah, oh, we got to ride 20 clicks today. It's, a, it's one kilometer. Chat GBT reaches 100 million active users in two months, the fastest growing consumer app in history. Ben is still not a buyer. I relented last week, and I said I'm in. Did I not? So the transcript tweeted, the fun take, approximate number of mentions of AI in earnings call in the latest earnings call. Google 62, Meta 33, Microsoft 31, Apple 2, Amazon 0. You know what my biggest problem with, with AI is? I'm just, I want to put the penalty box for people who, for the last four years, said crypto is going to change the world, Web3 is going to change the world, the metaverse is going to change the world. If you said those three things and pounded the table, you cannot say AI is going to change the world, even if it does. That's all I'm saying. No, I, I, no you're just overcorrecting for previous bad takes. That, no, that's what I said originally. I said it's just the people who are telling me I'm sick of tech people telling me the world is going to change, and they they say every year there's going to be this life-changing thing, and if you said it, although it's kind of like the people who call for a bear market or a crash every year. If you've been calling it for 10 years and it happens, you don't get to take a victory lap. That's my point. Uh, bad point, but All right. point Here, taken. Good, another good survey based on Michael's reading of his resume last week. Have you oh ever read? God. This is from the Compound YouTube channel. Have you read Ben Graham? And our, our YouTube channel skews younger. 56% said no. This is almost 1,000 votes. 44% said yes. That is surprising me. And you That's know, a lot of yes. You want to know why you think it's a lot of yes? 44%? I'm sorry. When I was coming up, everyone either owned that book, Intelligent Investor, or said they read it. or like That was the, the thing you got. But here's the reason why, I think. We didn't, when I came up, we didn't have, I, all we had was books. We yeah. did not have podcasts. We did not, blogs were just starting, basically. We did not have, you know, YouTube channel, none of that stuff. But Ben, it's not like all of our uh, viewers are financial professionals. It's True, a lot. But, but don't, if, if you're going to learn about investing, the the number one, if you type in best investment books, that was the one that came up for years and years and years, and it probably still does. Yeah. All right, recommendations, what do you got? All right, uh, Poker Face on Peacock. How is it? They keep, they keep advertising that. So the guy who did uh, Knives Out wrote oh. and produced it, it's uh, Natasha Leone, and... It, it's kind of great because the premise is this. It, it almost reminds me of one of my detective books where you kind of know the the hits, but it's a different environment. Like the 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 whole idea behind every episode is kind of the same. 
I like a good gimmick. So every episode starts with a murder. And you know what happens, then it then it backs up and figure out she figures uh, out what. That's a good premise. And she's a human lie detector. Like she can spot people lying. That's just like her gift is she knows people are lying. And every but every episode has a different cast of characters around her. And they're all pretty decently well known character actors on each show. And each show is its own story, even though it the kind of builds on each other. So I I like it. Uh I read I started reading on the plane actually, four thousand uh, weeks. Nobody cares. What else? By Oliver, yeah, books are kind of done. But he was this Oliver Berkman guy was on Derek Thompson's podcast last week, and someone had given me this book for my birthday last year, and I never read it because what's I'm, the book about? It's about time management and kind of how the all the hustle time management gurus like how you got to get more efficient, you have to do this and you have to do this. It's kind of like it's a never ending thing, yeah. And maybe it's okay to just cool it a little bit. Yeah, I like that. One more, I, I watched a movie I hadn't I'd watched it before. It's called The Giant Mechanical Man. It's a kind of a it's two down on the luck people, and it's like I think it came out in like 2012. I never heard of this. You wouldn't like it. It's it's a Ben movie, not a Michael movie. It's like a it's a rom com, but a lot of good character actors. Like Jenna Fisher from The Office is in it. I think her husband wrote it. But the and it's it's a decent movie. Good, not great. But the funny thing was to me, this is from 2012, and I'm guessing the movie was made even before then. There was two finance bros in the movie talking about buying a plasma TV, and the guy says, "How much did you spend?" And he said, "I spent three thousand dollars on a 50 inch plasma." First of all, do plasma TVs still exist? No. And also, my, my first TV was twenty five hundred bucks. In 2008? But remember when that was a, seven? that was an argument? Like, should I get a plasma or should I get a LCD or whatever? And people always said, like, if you leave your plasma on, the, right. the screen is going to get stuck on it. And plasma was like, that was the thing. And now, and of course, $3,000 for 50 inches. Mine was laughable. a 37 inch Panasonic. Does Panasonic? Ah, uh, Panasonic was my, that was, that was mine too, a 37 inch Panasonic. I had a 37 inch Panasonic, black rim, silver. And it was heavy, bottom, right? Super heavy. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think I recently just got rid of it. That TV held up better than the Samsung piece of junk. With a line on it. But 2,500 bucks for a 37 inch TV. Kids don't know how good they have it these days. Um, oh, speaking of kids, uh, our friend uh, of the show, Drew Dixon, is hiring. Let's see what he's hiring for. An analyst, a junior analyst, a junior analyst reporting directly to Drew. Uh, Are we a jobs website or jobs podcast now too? It's it's remote work. If you're a young person, you want to get into this. Drew is at Albert Bridge Cap. So go through his Twitter and you'll find out uh, where to apply. All right. I watched, I went to the movies this weekend, Ben. I saw a knock at the cabin. Not by myself. Brought a friend. Uh, Avatar was dethroned. This is from Eric Davis. Knock at the Cabin tops weekend with 14.2 million, becoming first 2023 film to top, to open number one at box office. This is uh, M Night's seventh film to open number one. Jeez, that is surprising. This actually the preview for this one, I haven't watched the last three or four of his movies. The preview for this one, I actually wanted to see. How was it? Okay, so the last movie that I saw, old, I swore off M Night for good, because I was 70 percent. Uh, entertain with old, the ending was, in my opinion, just a disaster. Just a total plane crash. Uh, knock at the cabin. Here's my take. Number one, Dave Batista, the former wrestler, was freaking awesome. He was good in the new Knives Out one as well. And I will say the first 80% of this movie, incredibly effective because like all of So here's a premise. Uh, two dads and their daughter are in a cabin in the woods and four people come like right off the bat, and say you have to make a choice. One of the three of you needs to sacrifice yourself, or there will be, um, or or there will be what's uh, the end of times? The apocalypse will happen, and you're kind of not sure if these four people are totally insane, or if what they're saying is actually happening. And it was very effective. Um, again, the ending was a li- fell a little bit flat, but overall. It, was it seems like it's hard to. The idea is probably better than the ending. It's hard to execute an, it's a all, good yeah, ending. The endings on that. are always tough, but this was, in my opinion, I had a lot more fun watching this than old. It was good. I still had a hard time finding a good movie to watch on the on the plane ride down. It was good. Uh, okay, this is not necessarily a recommendation per se. Oh, I, the other day I was watching Crawl on the couch, and Robin goes, "What the hell is this? Are you serious? You're watching an alligator movie?" And I said, do you not listen to the podcast? This is like a staple. <laughs> you rewatch. <laughs> and on, the, on, a, on a rewatch, I will say, ben, you, ben, you're a bad pepper guy. Yeah, I didn't know he was still around. That's a very good animal disaster movie. I stand by that. Um, so I watched, okay, this is on Hulu. David Cronenberg is demented. Just straight up demented. So is, uh, and I mean that in the best way possible. His son, Brian Cro- is it Brian Cronenberg? 
Brandon Cronenberg? I have no idea who you're talking about. David Cronenberg did The Fly and some other films that you've probably heard of. Uh, so his son did a movie called Possessor, which is one of the toughest movies I've ever seen in my life. Sci-fi, just way out there. Anyway, I saw a movie. Oh, Cronenberg did um, A History of Violence. Oh, East, okay. Oh, yeah. E- I like that one. Eastern Promises. Yeah. You ever see Eastern, Eastern Promises? Two Vigo Mortensen. Two Vigos. Another Vigo. All right. Crimes of the Future is the movie. And if you, this is not a recommendation because if you know it, you know it. I'm not telling you anyone to go watch this. This movie was so out there. So, so, so out there. I can't imagine this movie coming out of this guy's brain. Just totally demented is the best word to describe it. But if you are a fan of these what the f*** did I just watch movies, pretty effective. If you're a fan of bad movies like Michael, you might like this. I, this, is not, this is not a bad movie. It's an insane movie. Okay. It's an absolutely... Can't believe you re- rewatched Crawl. That was like a punching bag for a long time let me give show. you Let me give you the premise of Crimes of the Future. Okay. Crime, this is, this is not exactly, but all right. Humans adapt to a synthetic environment with new transformations and mutations. It's a science fiction body horror drama film. Yeah, it's a body horror science fiction. Yeah, it was, it was messed up. All right, that's going on my do not watch list. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, listen, you know where to find us? Animal Spirits Pod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.